I'm sure everybody has seen this gentleman on the left-hand side of this, and of course, also on the right-hand side. But certainly in the world of politics, there's clearly there's plenty going on. Uh, um, of course, you got Russia, and you got uh, the Middle East. Uh, um, but on the front, uh, on, on the global front, it has been, of course, the US and Trump. And if you haven't actually seen the gentleman before, and I'm sure if you have access to Twitter, you most certainly have read from him at some point in time. But for investors, yeah, I, I, I suppose it was more the spate over trade, particularly with China, that has preoccupied asset allocators over this period of time. At the end of 2018, we thought it had been resolved when they had a meeting somewhere in South, Amer uh, South America, and the whole talk was about them finding a solution, a temporary in terms of suspension of this trade uh, uh, um, war in which they are having. But like everything with Trump, I suppose it is only done when it's been signed. Uh, um, and we realize, uh, of course, it has not been completely uh, resolved. Uh, the stock market response to this was quite emphatic with a risk of attitude. And as we saw, the complete sell of, of um, risky assets at the end of, um, uh, of, of last year. It has recovered subsequently, but I suppose uh, um, the market gave their view certainly on that. But Trump is not the only uh, um, thing which is preoccupying or creating worry or anxiety for asset allocators. There are other sources of, um, of anxiety also. Um, feeling of an asset price of evaluation, I think is something that perhaps most of us also feel in terms of our own sector, the real estate market. When we look across Europe, we think probably given where yields and things are, most probably asset prices might be either be fairly, fairly priced or in some markets, I just think probably it might be overpriced or something like that. But that certainly is a feeling which not only just confined to real estate, but also to other asset classes uh, as well. Um, one, of, one thing also as we mentioned probably is the potential hard landing for China, which is something which others are also thinking of. But closer to home, of course, it's a political risk. And when you look across many of European countries, at least the top five, there is one form or the other of political kind of schism going on. Uh, in it. Uh, uh, and there's no presentation that you can actually mention Brexit in it. A peculiar British problem, I think. <laughs> I will probably put it that way. Among other things, but also um, something which I'm sure it is not on the minds of investors at the moment. And uh, we are certainly not calling that a risk in which we are to be focused upon, but we seem to be in a, in a transition mode and as far as Germany is concerned. And what I call the final goodbye uh, 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 for Merkel. Uh, uh, on this. It certainly is something that we are pricing as a risk, but we think probably something just to look forward to as how the smoother transition actually goes and what that will imply for Germany and therefore most definitely for, for, for Europe. Uh, but that, that is not all doom and gloom, of course. There's some good news uh, uh, and some reasons for us to be optimistic about the market. And if I'm to pick one particular area in which I think we need to be optimistic about, is certainly the sense that the central bank tightening of monetary policy seems to have been at least delayed for some reason. I think yesterday, the FOMC meeting actually reaffirmed their patience that they are going to have in terms of how quickly in things they are going to raise rates. And I think that is good news for, uh, for investors because it has been at the minds of investors for quite a fair bit as to what that would mean for, for real estate in, in that. And of course, with that potentially is um, emergence of the, uh, the recovery in the emerging markets, which we've seen quite a lot of problem with uh, um, over the past. Nonetheless, I think we are all feeling uh, definitely that in as far as the economic performance, global economic performance is concerned, is slowing. US, uh, certainly in, in the Eurozone also. If you look closely at, the, at Europe, the slowdown is quite evident, of course. Uh, um, this chart here presents two sort of things. One, on the right-hand side, you have the GDPs for the monetary blocks, and on the left-hand side, you have more details on the European economies. The one, the, the other one is the, what do you call it, the, uh, the one on the monetary blocks is much more from BNP, and then the European one is much more the consensus uh, economics forecast on that. Uh, there certainly is a slowdown in here. Um, certainly we see that for the UK and from Germany also equally. Uh, we see also see it on as far as um, uh, Italy is concerned uh, 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 in, in that particular sense. But for me, and as a, a real estate uh, uh, um, forecaster or real estate uh, um, economics person, the economic indicator which I associate much more with real estate is employment growth. 
it is a, it's the most important one for all asset classes. For retail, you need employment growth. For offices, it's employment growth. For industrials, also it's for employment growth. So this is the indicator which I look very closely uh, at. Here we see strong level of growth in most markets, at least over the past five years. Um, what, what, I used to, what, what I choose to call the recovery countries, uh, which is Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. In the past five years, this, this is the cumulative employment growth over that particular five-year period. And they've shown a very strong level of growth um, over that particular uh, period of time. And then, again, when you, when you look at uh, um, Sweden also, it's a very strong growth. Uh, Germany, UK, and Poland, they are all at a historical low unemployment rate. So naturally, there's little growth in which they can actually have in that particular context. So you have less growth in those kind of big, uh, big economies. But what is most interesting, of course, is the next five years, and we see them, they remain encouraging. Again, we have Spain, we have Sweden, uh, they have seen strong growth, and Netherlands equally uh, in, in this particular case. Somehow it is a reason for us to remain a little bit optimistic going forward for the real estate fundamentals. So that is much more for the economics, and I would like to move on to, um, to capital flows. And I think something which I think uh, Richard mentioned on, uh, uh, earlier on. Now, foreign investors remain hugely important for the European market. Uh, um, roughly 50% of what they call of investment done are done by cross-border investment. Um, in London, when you go, in, particularly in London, you have around about 80% of the transactions which are done are actually by overseas buyers rather than domestic. Of course, overall UK, it stays around about 50% level, but in London specifically, you have around about 80%. So cross-border investment is very crucial and as far as the real estate market is concerned. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about um, Asia Pac and American investors, which people are worrying so much. But when we look at, uh, at this chart here, it actually shows that a large part of the cross-border investments are done by Europeans within Europe itself, led by Germany and France, of course. So that's a very key point. Um, followed by the US, uh, which interestingly, as we talk about, and something I'll touch on later on, we talk about the late cycle. Uh, and that we are in at the moment. If there ever evidence that we are actually late cycle is the disappearance of the Americans from the market. They tend to come in quite quickly, swoop in, and then probably they exit quite, quite rapidly uh, uh, when the market is beginning to be at the very lateness of that. But we saw positive growth uh, in America and the only, only region where we saw growth on 2018 was from the America going. Then of course we have Asia, a strongly growing area in terms of a significant play as going forward, uh, as they will become. But now I'd like to dig a little more, de uh, a little bit more um, deeper into the European cross-border. So this chart here shows a number of things. One, um, you have on the right-hand side, you have the five-year evolution of the European investments, uh, um, cross-border investment in Europe. And then on the left-hand side, you show where they are actually doing the investments across uh, on that. Uh, uh, Europe, as I mentioned, is the largest, around about for nearly 50%. Uh, they have maintained a strong growth over the past five years. Over the five, five years, they have around about 10% growth on, on, on their investment. Their investment is widely spread across, across all the European countries, of course, because they are actually in Europe and they understand the market much more better. And therefore, their markets, the, the way they actually invest is they tend to be able to uh, spread themselves quite, quite widely uh, in that particular uh, um, context. Uh, the next one, which I'd like to look a little bit more detail, is uh, at APAC. Uh, a large increase over the last past five years, 20%. And as I said, they are the source of the strong growth in as far as cross-border investment is, is concerned. They are mainly in the UK and Germany. And this actually reflects their preferences for core assets and much more or less risk averse, if you like. And of course, when we talk about Asian investors, they, we talk of them as broad, but there's quite different uh, um, classes of Asian investors who have very different preferences in as far as the risk spectrum is concerned. But in general, they tend to be much more risk averse and concentrate their investment much more where they know better in terms of um, UK and Germany uh, on that. Uh, and, and here we've seen in terms of 2018, there's a fall in their actually, uh, uh, their, uh, fall in their investment volumes, but that is largely because of the lack of access for them to actually purchase at this particular point in time. It's not for lack of demand, but it's lack of supply, given their preferences for core assets in these core markets in which they are actually playing. And that's both wealth going forward into the future uh, um, for the European market. And I look a little bit directly much at Americans, and I see that the Americans here is quite completely disappeared. 
terms of uh, uh, their volume is, uh, uh, is down over the five years uh, period, around about 9%. Curiously, they actually <laughs> increased their investment in 2018 related to 17. And when you look details at where they are actually doing so, they are doing so much more at the southern European countries of Spain, Italy, uh, um, that kind of area. And part of this is actually to do, and I think probably here we count it as part of that, is much more of the MPLs in which they've been buying quite largely in, um, in, uh, in Spain, in particular by Cebros and, uh, and the rest of, of the play. So that actually shows that they are actually much more uh, willing to go up the risk curve and they tend to be in a market where they can find those particular kind of ten, ten, tens uh, of yields uh, uh, play on that. So, in as much as, as I said earlier on that it is not for lack of demand, but it's lack of um, supply of the assets for investors to actually uh, get their hands on. Uh, uh, majority of assets, um, but under allocation, uh, 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 most investors are under allocated and as far as real estate um, globally is concerned. Uh, um, target allocation, allocation uh, uh, is, is rising, expected to be around about 11% in 2019. It's continuously on, on that. Uh, um, the, there remains, um, uh, from a recent research by Prekin, there remains around about 1 trillion of dry powder available for investments uh, 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 by investors. And if we take this um, asset allocation around about 11% of that, for real estate, we are looking about almost around 100 billion which is available for real estate. And that is equity in that case. If you assume 50% of that is going to come to Europe, if we level up around 50%, we're almost there around about half, 50% of the investment volume which we actually did back in 2000 and what they call it, 2018. So the equity is there, the money is there to invest in Europe, but the core of problem which is holding back in, my, in many cases will be um, the availability of products for investors to be able to sort of, uh, um, um, to, to get on this. And as I mentioned, I'll go on quickly with this. According to INREV, there is a varied style of preferences. As I mentioned earlier, part, um, the Asia pack tends to be focused more on core. Europe is more eclectic. And then, of course, in the Americans, you have much more up on, 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 on the risk curve uh, on that. Uh, um, the next slide I would like to go on to is much more about the investment volumes, uh, uh, commercial real estate uh, investment across Europe. Overall in Europe, again, we saw a record year in investment for around, around about 264 billion, as I said, stable on 2017 numbers. All the market seems to have um, seen growth, except the politically troubled countries, if you like, of Italy and, and, and the UK. Uh, where we begin to see, on the right, on which you see it on the on the on the right hand side of the chart, where we have a negative one. Although UK is coming from a record year in 2016 and 17, and the volumes remain high above the historical average, uh, um, these figures, uh, in my view, underlines uh, uh, the continuing investors' appetite for real estate, and in Europe in particular, uh, going forward. Um, top among the list, of course, um, now, given that we are in, in a late cycle again, it's increasingly that these monies are looking for alternative assets. Uh, investors are looking and diversifying into higher yielding sectors, uh, 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 be it in the logistics or in the alternative assets being hotels or um, healthcare and risk. And they are doing so at the expense of retail. The trouble retail sector, of course, offices remains constant, it remains quite broadly the same by its retail, which is where they are taking most of their share from uh, on that. I thought this chart here is quite an interesting chart. And what it does is describes the, um, the gap between office and logistics. And at the moment, I take, what I call, I take um, retail out and compare the gap uh, between office and logistics. Despite the demand, the strong demand that investors have been making for, log um, for logistics, the yield between office and logistics has remained fairly constant over time which actually shows that and as much as investors are showing strong preference for logistics, they are not abandoning office in a hurry. But clearly, there is no, there's, this is not the same for all markets. You take UK, for example, uh, where you see that the gap is quite narrowed a little bit uh, further down, and also you have the Czech Republic where you also have the similar things. But these are largely due to the weakness in the office market, particularly in the UK. Not necessarily from the, so you, you have a strong demand for uh, logistics, but the office market, given what is happening with Brexit, is actually hampering that. And therefore, you have the, the gap between those two actually uh, 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 compressed further. 
whilst investors are actually diversifying by going up the risk curve, if you like, into logistics uh, uh, um, space, they are doing so, they appear to be doing so in the core markets. So they are buying the logistics, but they are buying them in the core markets. Uh, uh, why do I say so? Because when I look at the data, uh, in 2007, the, the logistics yield uh, between the core market and the non-core market, the gap was somewhere around about 70 basis points. In this particular line of the cycle, the gap is around 170 basis points, which means the yield in the core market is compressing much faster, if you like, than leaving what called a non-core side thing, which I thought was quite an interesting thing. So they might be diversifying in terms of assets, but they're not necessarily diversifying very much in as far as the location is concerned, in, in terms of their preferences uh, on that. Um, so that's marked more for, for, for the investment side, but I think the investment is actually underpinned by the strong performance uh, in the fundamentals of the real estate, which is much more on the occupier side. Uh, here I chose to show the vacancy rate, and I think the vacancy rate is a summation of all that is happening in the, in the occupier market, whether demand and supply or going to the same place. And the equilibrium is, of course, is in the, uh, uh, in the vacancy rate. Uh, whilst a lot of attention has been focused on investment and the yield compression, occupier market has performed fantastically. Um, here, I compare the end 2018 vacancy rates alongside the 15-year average of the vacancy rates. Uh, and the story is, uh, is the same if compared to 10 years, if you want the same cycle to compare to 10 years. You, you got the same, the, the same feelings of the story. In, in 2016 and 17, we saw low vacancy rate in the CBDs which compressed quite, you know, almost in Berlin, for example, at about 1.7%. It's nothing. There's nothing there, actually, uh, to be had. But in 17 and 18, saw the ripple effect to the wider market, if you like. Uh, an average vacancy in Europe at the moment is somewhere around about 6.6%, about 300 basis points below the long-term average. And in some cities, it's quite even much wider than that. And so you take Dublin, for example, you have around about 8%. Uh, um, gap in between that. Uh, um, Frankfurt and Amsterdam, uh, um, depending upon what definition you have, you have a different number, but nonetheless, you find a substantial differentiation between the long term average and the current level of vacancy, of vacancy in there. I simply do not know where all the buildings is gone, <laughs> all the space is gone <laughs> in this. In the, uh, similar developments, of course, can be found in the logistics market also, where you have a strong um, compression as far as the vacancy rate also is confirmed. Of course, manifestly, this is actually impacts in as far as the rental growth is, is concerned. And here I've just picked up a couple of the markets, which I think uh, are quite interesting uh, uh, on this. Um, this chart here shows the evolution of the rental growth, the prime rental growth since um, the financial crisis, or if you like, since this particular cycle in, in, in which, in which we, are, we, we are in. So over the last five years, Berlin, Stockholm have grown somewhere around about 50% in as far as rental rent is concerned. Uh, um, and you probably you don't see it over here, but Dublin is going up by 63% in as far as the prime, prime rent is, is, is concerned. Um, uh, one to watch, of course, is the Spanish cities, Madrid and Barcelona. Uh, um, here you have rental growth for the past five years around about 14, 45%. It doesn't look it, right, when you look at this chart here in as far as uh, uh, Madrid is concerned, because it's still below the, what they call the pre-crisis level. But when you look from 2013 for the five-year period, you see that the growth is somewhere around about 40, uh, 40 or 45 percent, similar to what is actually happening in Britain. For me, this tells me that there's more still to come in as far as these markets are concerned. And these are one places to, to begin to watch, if you like, for, for, for a substantial rental growth um, going forward. And this is in many ways reflected in our outlook in as far as the prime uh, rental growth uh, uh, is concerned. This chart here shows our rental forecast over the next four years, uh, um, cumulatively, which is what I like to see uh, uh, for the prime. We we know what happens in in the prime tends to filter also to the other mar to the sub markets and things. So uh, um, hence why I chose the prime one. We are bullish about the southern European markets, as I said, for catch up the Nordics, and still some more to come as far as German cities are concerned. Uh, uh, Markets for the German markets are largely because of lack of space and also for Amsterdam because of demand. And I thought this, this uh, model, this chart here is a little bit of an interest. And I think that what we are talking about constantly is that we are in the late in the cycle. And then the question which keeps coming up all the time is what will happen to um, yields when interest rate begins to rise? 
and bond yields begins to go up. And I think probably it's quite difficult to predict when that is going to happen. It's going to happen this year, and I think we have been predicting that for the past two years. That is, this year is going to happen, next year is going to happen. Um, but I thought it was a bit complicated in this environment to try to do that. So we took a different tack, and that to begin to ask the question as to at what level does the bond yields need to rise up to before we begin to see property yields responding. So we don't know when that is going to happen, but the question is at what level do we, we, do we need to get to before it actually uh, begins, begins, begins to kick in. Uh, uh, we did this for many a lot of the main top five markets and also for the sub-markets within. For, for example, for Paris, there's so many different sub-markets and different yields between them. So we did it for them. But here, what I've just put as just a sample of that um, for the office, retail, and logistics market. On average, we think probably somewhere around about 150 basis points, 1.5% in terms of bond yields to go up to that particular level across Europe before we begin to see the, um, the property yields beginning to sort of begin to have a meaningful response um, to that. Um, if you look at it from that particular perspective, and the question then arises as to where do we think we are in this particular current cycle, and when would the um, property yields begin to rise due to bond yields? Uh, and if you look at Germany, for example, today Germany is somewhere around about 0.2%, for example. France is somewhere around about 0.71%, which tells me that it's going to take a quite a fair bit of time for us to be able, and we know the economic and the political environment in which we are in at this point in time. It's going to take a bit of time for us to be able to push to those particular kind of levels of bond yields for the property yields to be able to begin to sort of to respond to, um, uh, um, to that. And from that particular perspective, we expect probably uh, at, at best, probably in the next 18 to 24 months before we actually begin to see the cycle to turn. So we might be in a late cycle, but we don't think we are yet at eminent turning points within the cycle as yet uh, from, from, from that particular perspective. Of course, there are other factors in which you might probably add to it and come to a different conclusion. But from purely from the rise, the impact of the rise of bond yields on property yields, we think probably we are probably another 24 months away from that before we begin to see. So we are optimistic in 2019 and 2020, part of it, um, before we see any major shift in, in property yields. However, what we do expect, though, is that investors cannot expect uh, um, the double digits total returns which they've been receiving for the past two years, for example. We think um, 2019 and 2020 will see a stabilization of what they call it, of yields, and therefore capital growth will not be as strong, except for the market where we think there's strong rental growth yet to come true, uh, uh, which is generally is the German markets and of course the Southern European market, as I mentioned when I, I produced the, uh, the, what they call it, the rental growth forecast uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, which, which means that income will do the heavy lifting in this particular process, which tend to be lower in, the, in that particular. We have the similar kind of uh, process for this, also for the logistics, but of course um, the returns that we have for that is slightly higher than the, uh, the office, largely because the yield is slightly also, also higher than you have in the office. And that is what the starting point for the total return from that particular perspective is a little bit higher in, the, in, in, in that sense. Um, and with that, I think I just leave you with our view on summaries of our views on the three main points uh, and the politics, uh, economics, and the financial markets are going to be of a challenge for real estate investment. And investors will need to be very uh, strategic in terms of selecting of assets, and they need to focus more on assets rather than on, on the broader market. Uh, we remain optimistic, as ever. Total returns will be um, lower than what we've seen before, uh, uh, but above all. We don't think that uh, the current cycle may be nearing an end, but we don't think the turning point is imminent in any, any form or shape.